This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello my gods and ghouls, my name is Steven. We have been deep into making the jig for testing the index motherboard. Last time Lucian got all the mechanics spun up so we can have the pogo pins push really cleanly into all the pads on the bottom of the motherboard. If you're lost, I'll put a card up here so you can catch up on what we're doing, but there is still a huge obstacle to overcome the code. This might be one of the most daunting software projects that I have ever tackled. There are three pieces of code at play here. First is a Python script that runs on the Raspberry Pi. This script orchestrates the whole test, does logging to the server, listens for the button press on the front of the jig to know when to start the test, dynamically uploads firmware packages to the board being tested, and generally keeps track of things and makes sure that all the tests are being run. The second piece of software is the firmware running on the control board. This is the board that we made a few episodes ago that connects to the pogo pin PCB with that big long ribbon cable. This firmware talks back to the Python script using just a UART connection, so just TXRX serial communication, and it gets commands from the Python script about what tests to run, and then once it's run them, it reports back to the Python script about how well it did. Lastly is the firmware that gets loaded onto the board being tested. It's really hard to check if all of the pins have been soldered correctly if we don't have the board being intelligent in some way and responding so that the controller knows, okay, cool, everything's connected correctly. And that's exactly what that firmware does. Mostly it just listens to all the pins and peripherals and if it hears something on any of them, it will respond in a way that the controller is expecting and then it knows, cool, everything's soldered. If I heard that, it must be the test firmware running and I am connected to it properly. So first off, an operator presses a button that the Raspberry Pi sees and kicks off the Python script. First thing is the Python script loads the test firmware onto the test board. After it's all loaded, the Python script tells the controller to run a whole bunch of different tests, testing GPIO, I2C, MOSFETs, power rails, all kinds of stuff. And then the Python script gets all that data back so it knows the status of things, it knows what passed and what failed. Then it gives one final command to the controller to then take all of that information and print it out in the receipt printer. Oh yeah, and then at the very end, the Python script flashes Marlin back to the board and then it's ready to rock. So this is a lot of code. <laughs> My friend and dev on the project, David, suggested that I try writing all of this code without ever touching the circuit boards. No testing it out, just sitting down and writing all of it right out of the gate before I ever interact with an actual PCB. The idea is that if you approach the project with the entire thing facing you, you'll go in building better infrastructure and a better base to make things much more understandable and easier to interact with. In comparison, writing little bits of code and testing them out little nuggets at a time, you're kind of building incrementally on top of stuff and you may not have a really nice overarching architecture that's really easy to change things and interact with. It can be a lot better for how your code looks and how easy it is to play with and edit if you go in and write the whole thing in a big logical way out of the gate, and then you start testing stuff. I gave it a whirl for this project, and I think it worked out really well. I actually started writing all of the code for this about a month and a half ago, before I even finished designing the boards for this project. I think in general, the benefit is that my code is so much better structured and way easy to understand, which is really important for this because this is complicated. There are three software packages all kind of talking to each other and interacting with each other, and it gets really confusing really quickly. Debugging problems was a little bit harder. If you're building out features incrementally, when you add a new feature and suddenly everything goes wrong, you know it was probably that feature you just added that caused the problem. But when you write everything and then just run it and it doesn't work, what isn't working? <laughs> it's a little harder to track down your bugs. That being said, it wasn't really that hard. It was very easy to navigate my code because I did write it in a pretty sensible overarching way. So it was pretty easy to isolate what the problems were even then. One of the absolute first things I got up and running was the receipt printer. Like I said before, this printer is controlled by the controller PCB and it prints out whatever data the Python script will send it to print. These things are so freaking cool. I love them so much. I wanna put them into every project I make now. Oh, they're so freaking sick. I, I love them. At first, I just had some fun printing some of my girlfriend's pixel art, but then I started building out a test receipt format that's gonna be really clear and easy to understand exactly what went wrong or what didn't when we print this thing out. I used the Prusa Mini receipt that we got when we bought a Prusa Mini a couple months ago as a template to see what kind of stuff would be good to include, but I did quickly diverge from that because we have some really specific things we wanna convey in this, but it served as a really good template to get started. One thing that the Prusa receipt doesn't have is failures. Of course, we're gonna get a machine that passed all the tests, so all we see is a perfectly passed printer, but what does it look like for a failure? What we decided to do is go through and write out an error code and a short description of every single thing that could possibly fail. This way, when the receipt prints out with a board that fails, you can rip it off, 
close pin it to a motherboard and you can see exactly what pins on the motherboard failed, exactly what tests. This is gonna make it so much easier for rework. Instead of just kind of jumbling around and trying to figure out what went wrong arbitrarily, you can literally know exactly what pin numbers on the STM32 might be disconnected or exactly what little analog cluster of circuitry you need to play around with. It's gonna make debugging so much easier. So I went into my code and I wrote out every single error code that could possibly happen, assigned them all an error code number, and then after a ton of debugging and solving a lot of really weird software serial buffer issues, I have the receipt printer printing out a receipt that is dynamically generated based on the test results. Check this out. This is a receipt for a board that failed. It failed everything. I literally just didn't put the board in the jig. You can see there's information about the serial number and the date that it was ran, the fact that it failed, and then all of the categories, power, GPIO pins, of which there are a lot, I2C tests, SPI tests, RS-45, and then the MOSFETs. And there's an error code and description for every single one so you know exactly what you need to look at to fix this board. This was after I added some bitmaps so we have a little logo and a big old check mark so it's really easy to tell at a glance whether or not that board failed or passed. And it'll tell you okay for all of the categories. I'm really excited about this. This is freaking cool. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love receipt printers now. I wanna use them in everything. So dope. So dope. Cool, so now it's time to actually start taking boards and putting them in the jig and running tests. So I take a board, I put it in, and almost immediately I hear a really loud pop and then some ominous buzzing. And then suddenly the controller and the test board just completely stop responding. A bit of debugging showed that both of the STM32s on both of the boards were completely blown. When I hook them up to power, they were pulling like an amp each. <laughs> I bought them for about $40 a piece, so this was devastating. <laughs> After a bit of poking around and trying to figure out what caused this, I replaced the STM32 chips and I tried again, and sure enough, I blew two more STM32s out. Same thing, pop and a hiss, and then the whole jig is buzzing and pulling a crazy amount of current. Another 80 bucks down the drain. Only then do I realize that I can't have the 24 volt pogo pin active when you drop the board in or take it out. If the 24 volt line and any random GPIO pin make contact before the ground pin, it's just gonna dump that 24 volts straight through the STM32 and ground it through a GPIO pin, blowing it out like no one's business. And because both STM32s are connected by their GPIO, it means they're both gonna blow out. <laughs> In retrospect, this is a little obvious, but it's not something I thought about at the time. I was really kicking myself about this for a few days, but ultimately I got over it and just moved on. It was a real frustrating mistake that ultimately cost me $160. Sometimes that's life. Anyway, the way I went about solving this in the short term is I just took the 24 volt line to the pogo pin and I cut the trace on the pogo pin board. And then I just jumpered it out to a switch on the front of the jig. So this way you can turn off the 24 volt line, put the board in, turn it back on, run all your tests, and then turn it off again before you take it out. Of course, this is incredibly prone to error if you forget to flip this switch. So down the road, ultimately, I'm gonna have a relay toggling it on and off when it's time to run the test, and maybe even better, have a switch that can detect when the platen is pushed all the way down, and only then let the power come on and off to really make sure it's never gonna drive a board that isn't perfectly seated. Pretty frustrating, ultimately, and really expensive, but I learned my lesson. <laughs> Okay, cool, so now finally I can actually put a board in the jig and talk to it and run tests with it. The very first step is loading the test firmware onto the target board so it can actually interface with the controller and we can actually run a test. The way I'm flashing this firmware to the board being tested is with this sucker. This is a blue pill microcontroller. It has the classic STM32 F103 chip on board, but I flashed it with the same firmware that goes on a Blackmagic probe, which is a really awesome debugger and programmer for ARM chips. And when you put that same firmware on this chip, this thing acts like a Blackmagic probe. It's really cool. That firmware lets this board act not only as a programmer for an ARM chip using either JTAG or SWD, but it also breaks out a second port on your computer that acts as a UART or just serial communication, which is really handy for being able to both program a board and talk to it over serial using just one interface. It's it's really awesome. I use a normal off-the-shelf Blackmagic probe for general programming and debugging of all these boards, but I didn't want to spend the $60 to put one into this jig, so I decided to just buy some of these and program to act like one instead. This ended up being a huge mistake. It might have been cheaper to buy one of these blue pills and try and program it with the firmware, but trying to get this thing running correctly took me an entire two days of work, and even then it still doesn't work. I ended up just making some bodge wires and using my actual Blackmagic probe instead. Big, big lesson learned here. It is totally worth the money to spend a little bit more on a tool that works for sure than to try and save a buck and maybe have to burn like $30. 
two or three days working on something that you just wouldn't even have to deal with otherwise. It definitely comes back to that whole tool or project dichotomy that I'm so about. Do you want something that just works and it's its own little black box and you don't have to think about it and it's just going to solve a problem for you? Or do you want something that you're gonna have to get into the weeds for and really deal with all the nuance and solve a problem with? For this one, I chose a project and I should have chosen a tool. It was only 50 bucks more or so. It really wasn't that much more money ultimately and I totally would trade 50 bucks to get two full days of my time back that's an easy one. I should have learned my lesson from Lucian about buying that jig off the shelf instead of building it from scratch. We realized it'd be a lot cheaper and quicker to build this from a kit than to design everything from scratch. This is solved for 60 to $80 on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't where we needed to be creative. Again, lesson learned. After a few more days of refining the firmware and testing it a bunch, it's done. So you can take a board and put it in, flip the power switch, Press the button and wait a minute for all the tests to run and then you'll get a receipt printout of everything that passed and failed. There it goes. <laughs> oh, that's a check mark. We passed, baby. We passed, baby. <laughs> oh, man. There it is. <laughs> this was such a fun project and one that's really going to make sure that we are only shipping boards that work and are completely fully tested. So. Some lessons learned. One, it's rad to try and write all the code without ever trying to run it. It really makes you think about why you're doing what you do and how to set up the, the design and the infrastructure of your code in a way that makes it easy to edit, easy to change. It's great, and I think I'm gonna do this a bunch in the future. Second, the connection sequencing of pins on a microcontroller is so important. Everything needs to be super duper grounded before you apply power. Duh. I know, but... Wow, was that lesson beaten into me from this project. <laughs> and third, saving 50 bucks is definitely not worth two days of frustration. When it's not something nuanced and something creative that you're actually adding value to, just buy the tool. Don't work on the project. There's nothing we could have bought off the shelf that would test this motherboard for us. So we did have to design these circuit boards and write all this code from scratch to do it. But as much as we can possibly outsource to other proven solutions, like buying an off the shelf Blackmagic probe, we really should. Really, really glad I learned that lesson and it's definitely gonna inform how I decide to do things in the future. Moving forward, I have been waiting for a bunch of parts to come in so that I can actually start populating the motherboards with all the indexes I built a few episodes back. But as I'm sure many of you know, there is a worldwide silicon shortage going on right now. So not only are chips really, really expensive, but they're also really hard to get. All those indexes that I made are in the shop ready to rock, but I just need the parts and the panelized boards before I can start diving into production. In the meantime, the next video might be about how to panelize circuit boards. I just had to do this and it was quite a tumultuous experience. So let me know in the comments if that's something that you'd like to see. Anyway, that's it for this one. I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to help support me and projects like this, there's a link in the description where you can become a patron. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. But before I go, I wanna thank this video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay made all the boards in the motherboard testing jig and they all look and work beautifully. I actually got in some panelized versions of the ring light and the motherboard also from PCBWay. I'm not gonna show you quite yet. That'll be for the next episode, but they look so cool. They look so cool. These are some really weird boards. I panelized them myself. So I just submitted it like one big circuit board and they did a really good job with them. They look great. I'm super stoked. If you're looking for a board shop, I highly recommend PCBWay. Thank you so much to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. First is a Python script that runs on the Raspberry Pi. Oh my god, shut up.